welcome to Inside Healthcare. High levels of bacteria have closed some of the parks and the beaches in um, Minnesota and um, through the month of June and July. So we've come to the urgency room in Egan to talk with Dr. Christy Trussell to, about these waterborne illnesses. So what are the most common causes of these illnesses? Well, usually it's higher levels of bacteria in the water, though sometimes there are other illnesses that are caused by parasites. So is there any way you can tell, like, if a, a water is contaminated or has bacteria in it? Well, not by looking at it. We rely on the Department of Health and, and our... To give us notices mm -hmm. and stuff. So how do you know if you've been exposed to these waterborne illnesses? Are there symptoms that are common? Well, the most common symptoms of waterborne illness would be vomiting, diarrhea, stomach cramps. Well, that could be a variety of things. And then when should you go seek emergency care, like coming to the urgency room? Well, at the urgency room, we really get con more concerned when folks get dehydrated. Um, we are able to provide IV fluids for dehydration. Otherwise, more serious types of diarrheal illnesses are characterized by severe abdominal pain, high fevers, or bloody stool. And are there certain individuals, like children, are they more at risk for these type of waterborne illnesses? Well, children in general are just higher risk for dehydration anytime they oh, get sick. But, sense, yeah. but particularly diarrheal illnesses, it can be hard for a child to keep up, particularly very little ones who don't know that they need to drink. It may just not feel like it. And we're into the hottest month now in August here. So what advice do you have for parents and caregivers to protect their little ones during the rest of the summer? Sure. So when you're when you're out swimming, you know, check your check the notices from the Department of Health and, uh, for areas that are closed. When you're in the water, try not to drink the water and always shower after swimming in a lake or a pool. And if you have any cuts, you want to make sure that they're sealed or covered up in oil. Yes. Yeah, so there, that's actually a different type of bacteria, but there are bacteria in the lake water that can cause a uh, more serious skin infection. Did you go tanning? You're getting so tan. We need some sun. Protect yourself. Protect your friends. Stop tanning. Learn more at spotskincancer.org. Joining us now is Mike Hansen, the director of Minnesota Office of Traffic Safety, to talk about Minnesota's new road safety laws. And we have a couple on the books that went in effect on August 1st. Why don't, I think a lot of people are familiar with at least the one in particular, um, hands-free while driving law. Why don't you tell us what it's all about? We, we would I'm hope. glad we, to have you here too, Mike. Right. Well, and thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, we worked very hard to get the word out about the hands-free law as we led up to it. Uh, it literally started the day that Governor Walls signed the legislation into law uh, with our media outreach and, you know, really any platform that we could think of to get the word out to educate Minnesotans ahead of time what they can and they can't do. And the beauty of the law is its simplicity. You can't have the phone in your hand That's at all. All, simple. <laughs> period. Unless you're involved in some type of a life-threatening emergency where you need to summon help, that is the one exception uh, for uh, everyday drivers. Uh, but other than that, the phone just can't be in your hand. And if you have even if you're at a red light or a stop sign, if you are part of traffic, which means if you're sitting at a red light, sitting at a stop street. sign, if you're stopped in traffic on, during rush hour, you cannot interact with that phone. You cannot have it in your hand. The only way you can utilize that is through single touch or through voice activation. Now there are some things that you still can't ever do with that and that's video streaming, surfing the web, oh shopping gosh. on the various websites out there, checking bank statements, things like that. But you can use the phone as a phone. You can compose or have text messages read to you and you can use navigation applications as long as, again, you follow that hands-free rule and you're only interacting with it in a single touch or voice activated mode. For navigation apps, for instance, the, the biggest thing that we're telling folks to do, program it before the car goes in gear, set it, and you don't have to worry about it. Perfect. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, I noticed that this, um, watching it coming through the legislature and stuff, this was brought by our Minnesota drivers and families who lost loved ones as a result of people on the phone and Distract, distracted driving and stand. that's exactly it yeah. and and I was privileged to work with many of those families oh, who lost loved heart. ones yeah. uh, as a result of distracted driving crashes and they truly were 
the, the octane that fueled this uh, throughout the legislative process and that finally got it over uh, the finish line and brought it into law. So, um, you know, the, the day the law went into effect truly belonged to them because it was a years long effort on, by many of them uh, to, to bring the attention to the law that it needed to get it through that, uh, that um, legislative process. And so now the law is on the books and, um, you know, we can move forward from here and prevent anybody else from having to join the club that nobody no, wanted to be a be member horrible. of. Yeah. Yes. So what is the penalty or the fine? And I understand, the f was it even the first day a couple hundred people got ticketed? I, I don't know right? if it was that many the first day. I think if we oh, looked at yeah. statewide law enforcement numbers, the number was probably something similar to that, but I haven't seen anything, any tallies yet. Um, anecdotally, uh, I traveled up to Lakes Country and back this weekend, and I saw significantly less oh, cell phone use uh, in, in that trip. So that, that's gratifying. Um, there are still a few folks who are not making the right decision um, and are choosing to put their needs above road safety, which is, that's not good. That's not what we want. Um, the fines, it's a little bit unique, and this tells you how seriously our legislators took this law in that they're graduated, which is kind of unique for any moving violation. The first offense, when you look at the fine and all of the court costs and surcharges that go with it, it'll be $120 to $130 fee, uh, depending on the county that you're in. For second and subsequent you offenses, you pay court costs and things as well. Right, right. right. Yeah. The the fine itself is fifty bucks, and then uh, you add in about seventy dollars for uh, surcharges and court costs. For second and subsequent offenses, that fine uh, goes up to two hundred and seventy-five dollars plus those court costs and surcharges. So you're going to be looking at over three hundred dollars for second and subsequent offenses as we move forward. So uh, it is a law that the legislators did take seriously. And other states that have enacted similar laws, the 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 number of accidents and fatalities and distracted driving has really gone down as well. So that's exactly it. Yeah. You know, everything we try and do as far as traffic safety is data driven. In at the time that we started down this journey with this legislative session, 15 states had hands-free uh, laws on the book. 13 of those 15 states realized a 15 percent reduction wow. in the number of fatalities that they experienced after their hands-free law went into effect. So um, we all hope Minnesota is above average. So we're hoping for a bigger drop than that. Um, but we, we really do believe that, that as this law goes into effect and as more and more and more and eventually every Minnesotan complies with it, that we will see those reductions. So talking about fatalities, uh, last year we went over 100 fatalities, uh, most in more than a decade, and that was related to speeding. In Primarily, primarily, right? And alcohol perhaps even a little bit too? Right. When we look at, at, at speeding, that's, a, that's always uh, overrepresented uh, as far as a contributing factor. And speeding in motor vehicles has been a problem since the, the motor vehicle first came around. Even before that, uh, we raced horses and then we raced each other. So um, it, it's a problem that we're constantly trying to address and it is consistently one of the top four. When we look at, at the vast majority of fatal crashes, it's distraction, it's impairment. It's the very few number of Minnesotans who still don't buckle up and speed. I can't believe that. Yeah, if we take care of those four things, we could almost get our, to our goal of zero fatalities on our roads. Uh, so speed, yes, again, last year we saw a, a rather significant uptick and our number of speed-related fatalities was over 100. So we're going to continue to try and find those strategies to get uh, better compliance with our speed limits. And then just very quickly, too, um, 4th of July was a long holiday weekend and we had a number of DWIs arrest during that time. And we're coming up on the Labor Day holiday weekend later this month, so. Right, and, and we will have extra enforcement out over the Labor Day weekend. And our biggest advice is to plan ahead and speak up. If you are going to go out and if uh, alcohol uh, is part of that, that celebration for that long holiday weekend, plan ahead, have a ride, have a place to stay, do something in order to not put yourself behind the wheel when uh, that's not a good decision. And if you see somebody who's going to make that bad decision, help them make a better decision. It's up to all Minnesotans to work together to keep our roads as safe as they can and to prevent those, those absolutely tragic, horrific, and 100% 100% preventable impaired driving crashes from taking place out there. So it's really plan ahead. You've got Uber, you've got Lyft. There's really not a lot of excuses left out there for somebody to get arrested for DWI.
And just very quickly, there was one other new law that went as the slope hook law. Why don't you tell us? The left, the left lane left law. Lane. Yeah. It's basically just a, a rewrite uh, of a law that's been on the books for years. Um, and it simply encourages drivers, if that right lane is available, that's where you need to drive. So the simple message is pass left, drive right. And if there's someone off the side of the road or a state trooper, definitely go over to that. Definitely lane. move over and give them that lane so that they can do their job safely. Well, Mike, great advice. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. That. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And we'll be back with more on Inside Healthcare right after this. Drownings are a leading cause of death for young children. Make sure kids learn how to swim. Always watch them in and around water and properly fence all pools. Simple steps save lives. To learn some new ones, visit PoolSafely.gov. And welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Join us now. We're very pleased to have with us two local avid bicyclists, Mike and Bill Madden. And they just represented Minnesota in the Race Across America. And get a load of this, 3,100 miles from California to Maryland. And you did yes. in six days and 10 hours. And then you also helped raise money for leukemia and other blood cancers disorder and as well. So an amazing, amazing trip. I don't know how you did that. It and was you, so much fun. And, you know, be, you were saying before you even, this morning, 5 a.m., both of you were up bicycling 30 miles before you even did anything else for the rest of the day. So it was another 3,100 miles, right? But you didn't do it all yourself. You had a whole team. Why don't you tell us about the race for, uh, across America and, and how that all came about? Mike, we'll start with you. Well, it was some friends, and we were, Bill and I were asked to be part of a team, an eight-person team to do the Race Across America. And that's an event that started in 1982. It goes across the country, like you say, and you can do it as an individual, a solo competitor, or a two-person team, four-person team, or an eight-person team. We are part of an eight-person team. In your team, you had other people from other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Why don't you tell us about your team, Bill? Yeah, sure. Well, we had uh, Lisa Laun, who's from Minnesota, Lake Elmo area, myself, Mike, um, Bob McEnany, who's a professional triathlon coach. Um, he lives in the Woodbury area. Um, let's see, who else from Minnesota? Then we had our, well, I'll go for the racers first. So. And then we had a gentleman, Mirko, from Italy, and uh, uh, another guy from Germany. Um, and one other from Minnesota, Chris Lee. Okay. Yeah, and then, Chris Lee from Minnesota. So eight racers, and then there was a crew of eight also. And Tom Nickham, don't forget our leader, from, who lived here but now lives in Palm Desert, okay. California. And but, you also had mechanics? On with you as well, or their, we, your crew? or We did. We had a support crew. There was a medical doctor and mechanics and kind of a number of people that are at least basic bike mechanics. And uh, they had a difficult job because they drove support vehicles that we'd carry bikes on the racers that weren't racing. And the racers would be out usually one at a time, kind of did it as a relay all across the country for 3,100 miles. So why did you guys do it? Why did you want to take part in this race? <laughs> well, I remember um, we were riding. Oh, we, well, we, I had learned about uh, some of the team members had done what's called the race across the West, and that was kind of intriguing to me. And then I was just biking one day with Lisa Lowen, and, and she said, you know, she said, you know, if we ever, uh, did the race across America, would you be interested? And I said, I absolutely would. I'm sure my brother would too. That was some years ago, maybe three years ago or something. And then uh, Tom Nickham decided to spearhead a team about, oh, he probably started working on it about a year and a half to two years ago. So how yeah. do you get ready for a race like that? And what's involved And you start in California? And yeah. Well, for us, I mean, just our morning rides is, pretty good right there. Really good riding, training. Yeah, good 30, 30 miles, miles every, every morning day. for what you've been doing this 25 years or so. Yeah, yeah, a long time. Yeah. But uh, we learned a lot. There's, 
you think you're kind of prepared to yeah. do something like this. And a lot of it is not just riding, but just the logistics and planning and how do you do it most efficiently. And um, until you actually do it, you don't really know. And I think the things we learned were that we brought too much stuff. Uh, we yeah. didn't have it organized like we thought we did. So if you're trying to access something, whether it be something leaving as, things along the way as you well something as simple as sunglasses or whatever grabbing them and, uh, so I think if we were to do it again we'd be much better prepared ha after having gone through that experience so, go ahead. so well so so one of the things is we did it as a relay so we're riding individually just for short segments so we can just put almost a hundred percent of our energy in that short segment so we're we're riding hard for say 20 minutes then we're off for an hour but that time we're off you know either if it's raining out you want to change your kit or whatever or all of a sudden it's sunny out you want to get your glasses on or you got to get some nutrition and that's where we found you know we could probably be better organized in terms of how all our nutrition is all set up our kits are all set up so we can have easy access instead of twisting and turning, trying to figure out everything, because before you know it, you're off again for another hard stint. So how long would you ride in these little stints and stuff? I mean, like well, you know, in general, we rode for 20-minute periods. 20 minutes. Uh, so there'd be, we had two and groups. Those are hard. Yeah, we, had, we basically days. split our team into two squads, a blue squad and a red squad. And you were called the Scorch Scorchers, as your name is. Yeah, Scorchers. Right. And, and then so we had two four-person teams of racers along with four crew in each. So um, we were on for, say, 12 hours straight riding. And during that time, what we're on, we're riding individually in 20-minute segments. So it's kind of like a relay. So we're always moving at Incredible. good speed. Yeah. So and then we do the big transition after about 12 hours, and then the other guys are riding. Uh, and that, um, so. when I talked with you previously, you were saying sleep was something that was hard to get, like to you were getting enough sleep because you're constantly going. And Our original plan, we thought we'd get decent sleep, but it didn't work out that way. It was much shorter than we thought. But getting back to your point, why you do something mm -hmm. like this or, or why would somebody be interested, it's, it's just one of those things that you have on a bucket list and sort Not of on my a, bucket list. <laughs> different, people have different different things and, and this was one of them I think for both Bill and I and probably the rest of the people on the team as well. Something to do, something to try and part of that dream where if you have the chance to do it you've got to just take it while you can and I think that's what our idea was. Do it while well, we have the chance. Incredible. So why don't you kind of take us through just really quickly from the start to the finish. I mean, you, the road conditions, weather conditions, what were some of the things that you faced on that trip? In addition to the endurance of constantly going. Well, it started well before the actual race because Bill and I drove down to the start and so that was the start of the adventure oh, driving that's to California. What, a couple thousand miles, right? <laughs> right, with the bikes yeah. and stopping at roadside diners and just kind of having a blast doing that. And then um, actually getting there uh, was just amazing where they have the big start thing set up and, uh, you know, kind of a big uh, deal to start. And then. Um, the first half of our team started during the day and we took over at night, so it was dark. Oh, and well, that's probably good because it was probably really hot too, right? California? It was a little bit cooler for our part. Yeah. Yeah, and just to mention that, you know, we had to get down there some days before because there's all these inspections. You have to fit out ah. your bikes with certain reflection reflectors and uh, the cars have to be fitted out. They look like police cars before they're done with all these lights, all in, with a specific protocol. Yeah. And then they, they have all these inspections. You have to go to seminars to learn all these road rules, et cetera. Uh, I can see so, how that would be really important yeah. on an open road. Were you on county roads, interstates, We streets, were on everything. everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so we, you know, the, the one squad started off for the first 12 hours and then we took over in a town called Blythe, California, right on the Arizona border. And then we went for another uh, at least 12 hours. I think we had a Is that mountain day. area or is that desert area or it's, kind of both? Well, it's desert and Blythe and it starts off pretty flat. We had a blast because it was nighttime and Mike and I are used to riding at night. So we were just flying. We kind of had a tailwind. And, and then eventually it starts to climb into the mountains in Arizona. Uh, we just had a wonderful time uh, that first day. It was a long day, because uh, that's one of the days where we, we got, took the, the crew took the wrong turn, so. Oh no. Uh, but, but we got back together. And so we went through Arizona, and then Mike, you can talk about the second day. And, uh, well, that beginning, I think, was the my favorite part where the, you see a lot of the other teams, you're still kind of close to them. And oh, you are? As, okay. as the race progressed, it went apart and you didn't see other competitors as much. But when you did or when you'd pass them, it would be kind of fun to do that. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. You know, it's 3,100 miles. Yet all every day we would see racers and officials and all this, you know, you'd think you wouldn't, but it seemed like, you know, you felt definitely you were in the heat of a race the whole way, at least I did. And you were saying when you got into Colorado, there was snow you ran into? There was. I was surprised. We went over Wolf Creek Pass and I was surprised how deep the snow was. So yeah, I was funny. trying to think tell, that's like over 10,000 feet, isn't it, in that area or uh, something? It is, yeah. like 11,000 or something. 10,800 and something, I think. But it's, it's just amazing how you can go from 115 degrees in the desert to like 40 degrees and there's snow all over the place. And the in Missouri, you had a reroute because of flooding, is that right? Or Yes, so once there? we headed into Missouri, they had us rerouted due to all the flooding. And we actually went on some interstate freeways. And in my opinion, that was probably the most precarious oh section, just trying to navigate through there. And I know I, was ha I happened to be on a section, well, we all kind of were, but right during rush hour, you know, so it's real busy. Um, but, you know, it was, we were moving fast. I mean, you can ride really fast on <laughs> freeways, I determined. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then before that, we went through Kansas, and we had a nice tailwind, and the weather was cooperative, and we were just moving through there. We all wanted to be on the bike, you know. We were, we were transitioning about every 20 minutes. Everyone wanted to have their shot, you know. Um, it was real fun riding. And then... But the race goes regardless of conditions, whether it's rain or snow or... Mm -hmm. um, wind it goes 24 7 and there were a couple of days where we did have rain and so you're putting on rain jackets and no, nothing really severe though thunderstorms or tornadoes or anything yeah, in you the know areas. it rained no. when we were uh, entering Colorado I remember we had a little bit of hail and some kind of heavy rain okay um, nothing it didn't seem super dangerous or anything and then the other squad had lightning all over the place but it actually wasn't really raining scary. on them yeah but it actually wasn't raining they were just kind of through this window other teams got you know plastered with the rain at times and then in the east i know that one day one of the last days it seemed to rain that whole day it started to get a little old you know we were out, out on the bike for about 12 hours and it was pretty much kind of a constant drizzle or rain you know very little uh, let up on that, but and get it, nothing Gettysburg dangerous. Gettysburg was beautiful going through there, or serene, or... Gettysburg was very, very weird, and Bill was the one out on the bike. I was in the car, and we just felt something different. You probably can describe yeah, it Yeah, you know, um, I had the pleasure to be the guy on the bike during that segment, and it was around dusk, the sun was just setting, and... You know, I'm used to just getting on the bike and pretty much going 90% or, you know, ramping up and riding pretty hard. Well, as I started to get, enter that zone, I just, it's almost like someone was just saying, hey, slow down, you know. Well, I just keep um, getting goosebumps. Yeah, just, yeah. I actually had goosebumps and I, I just, 
I just literally kind of couldn't do it. You know, I would I was going maybe 18 miles an hour or something, but you know, we're usually going like 24, oh. or 23 or something. And uh, it was really I had nothing. I'd never experienced that before. Uh, I seen these mounds and these uh, monuments here and there. It was uh, quite an experience. Mm. I want to definitely go back there for a tour at some point. And you were saying this was the ride of your life, this whole thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a time where rarely were we on the telephone talking to family members because we were just so focused. But I think uh, maybe it was Marsha who'd call you, or maybe it was Deb, I don't know, and said, so are you enjoying yourself? Mike says, every single second, <laughs> you know. So. Wow. We're running out of time in the show here, but if they want, if they want to read more, see the pictures, do you have a blog? or uh, Facebook or something where they can learn more about their trip and stuff? And We do. Um, scorchers Cycling. Team Scorchers or something. No, and you do have your plaques here. You came in fourth out of the teams. There was a big banquet at the end, and so all the teams got a nice plaque, and it was just a nice way to wrap it up. But once you're done with something like that, it's a big kind of difference or letdown because you're just out riding each day and all of a sudden it's back to real life. So there's a big adjustment there. And then just very quickly, you did raise money for leukemia and blood cancers, a, a tremendous amount of money. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, one of our team members has a daughter afflicted with the disease and so we chose to, in addition to do the event, we wanted to raise some money and we had a goal of 50 thousand dollars and we're very very close to that. I that think we were incredible. over I think we're up to 48 something right now. That's wonderful. So well I'm afraid we are out of time. I, we should have booked an hour-long special to hear about your trip so yeah. thank you appreciate for appreciate talking to being us. with us Mike and Bill. And, thank you. And congratulations. Thank um, you. Amazing amazing trip. Yeah. So Thanks. thank you. And we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope you join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then everyone. Thank you.